when developers get the chance to sit down and design an entire series for a video game, there are different ways to go about how you want to put it together. You can have the story move around from the main setting to spin off places and back again with little continuity like the Mario games. You can do something radically different like how Titanfall moved to Titanfall 2. Or you could be like Zelda and have a bunch of unconnected nonsense adventures happen. But the Dead Space series might be the one with the tightest continuity in all of video games. When video games get called linear plots, Dead Space is more like the linear series because it's now been a single string tying together quote-unquote four titles in this series, leading us to Isaac Clarke waking up on Titan Station after being picked up from space by the Earth government, conducting that whole marker business using the same logic as the Umbrella Corporation, except somehow more uncontrollable. It's a weird thing to see when you thought that this series was gonna pump the brakes anymore, because they'd already topped the odometer, but somehow are able to pull nitrous from their ass and go faster. Right out of the gate, before even relearning the controls of the game, Isaac is bound and strapped, watches someone transform into a necromorph literally two inches from his face, which doesn't really work as a scare because it's just the game screaming at you for a minute, and then becomes witness to Titan Station falling the fuck apart as another necromorph invasion is already underway and everyone important has been evacuated. Thankfully, he gets on with some help suspiciously quickly as he nears the end of the hospital section and picks up another plasma cutter. And speaking of such, it's a good thing that literally nothing about the game's combat has changed one bit, because it just works. It was a terrifying back-to-the-wall combat based around crowd control and accuracy under pressure, and it was perhaps the best way for Dead Space to try and marry a horror game with a third-person shooter. Plus, it's an oddly familiar brand of uniqueness that longtime players can immediately identify with, like Gears of War's interminable cover-based combat. But with that also comes the problems. Namely, the return of Dead Space's incredibly shitty RPG upgrades, which again, give you zero resources to upgrade effectively, so your best bet is to just dump it all into health and maybe get two damage upgrades for your favorite weapon. It would have been good for Dead Space as a series to implement a good upgrade system since the enemies upgrade exactly as you'd expect from an RPG and other iterations. We'll discuss this later, but for now, let's see how Isaac is adjusting to his new surroundings. Titan Station as a locale tackles one major problem I had about the original game, and it's nice to see Visceral taking some criticism on board this time in order to improve. The USG Ishimura was a mining vessel and therefore was designed to be practical, fit for purpose, and efficient meaning that every part of the ship looked exactly the same, and the constant corridors got really boring and repetitive, even as the challenge kept increasing. The Titan Station, otherwise, is a population management and usage facility meant to be a floating city around Saturn, and therefore has places like a mall, a school, and a unitologist church in order to hit all the typical Silent Hill tropes in one spectacular odyssey. Now, if you're wondering why the hell Visceral decided to have a school be a major section of this game, well, let's introduce you to what Visceral actually added to this game while in the midst of their little brand change. The Necromorph Children. The Necromorph Children are that style of Alpha Dream background creepiness where you start to realize as you're cutting through the hordes that the disease has spread to the six-year-olds that were going to their education. They are in fact the easiest enemies in the game and they disgorge ammo and health like sodden pinatas that are more annoying to fight than anything else. But on top of that, we get some new friends like the Spitters, who are more difficult because they are projectile-throwing monsters who have insanely high accuracy, and if they manage a hit, then you're not allowed to sprint for a long-ass time. They are numerous, resistant to damage, and at least a thankful reprieve from seeing those Manta Ray leaping dickheads all over the place. It is an improvement to the game's combat to have more monster variants, but not by much. However, what was an even bigger plus in Dead Space 2 was that Visceral finally relented and had made Isaac Clarke into a character in his own story. 
No more silent protagonism this time around, we finally get to hear him speak like Soap McTavish. And it is effective because Dead Space 2's plot kinda needs Isaac to be involved, since rather than dealing with simply surviving an infection, we are now dealing with the aftermath of the original game's events. Isaac Clarke had been subjugated into psychiatric treatment for obvious Nicole's alive reasons, and now that everything's falling into disaster, his delusions are getting worse to the point that Hallucination Nicole is actually a character in this game, where she's trying to somehow help Isaac and manipulate him, yet like James Sunderland, he manages to hold together his psyche a lot better than you'd expect because he is able to see through his delusions but the marker's hold is growing stronger. And along for the ride, we also have Isaac's on-again, off-again bunkmate Strauss, who seems to be suffering in the exact same way. He adds a lot to the early game's mystery by throwing things off kilter, and prodding Isaac while they both fall into their illusions more, but in the end, he also doesn't do much and is basically another radio voice along with the one talking more sense in Dana, who seems to have a cure, and you know what that means, we're going along with that old Dead Space staple of bumbling around objectives. Yeah, you can't have all good things in one package, because Dead Space 2's basic objective for Isaac at all times is basically walk around until you magically arrive at your destination somehow. There will be vague, you have to fix the thing with the thing and the thing stuff to do, and the game tries to do some new things by adding hacking minigames to the mix, but since it's not in the core gameplay and the minigame is frankly boring, it's easily ignored. Later on, after Isaac survives a couple of runs in with some big boy necromores, we get to meet the best character in the game, and ironically, also the one who seems to be the least involved in it. Ellie, an amazing survivor of the same tidal wave of constant disaster as Isaac, including watching her entire platoon die and become necromores, who she subsequently kills. She also is basically a radio voice for the entire game just thinking of her own survival, and since Isaac seems to be the best chance she's got, she becomes de facto babysitter of Nolan Strauss as he falls into his psyche freaking hard. Having a straight man playing against the insanity of the situation is important for survival horror to work on all cylinders, so I am thankful that Ellie is here. And on that note, there's nothing like kicking off some adversity with a bit of betrayal, isn't it? Because about halfway through the story, Dana, the person waving around the idea of a cure for Isaac, turns around revealing her government connection, and fails in having Isaac quarantined and stopping the destruction of the marker. Because, again, the government is basically the Umbrella Corporation. After that failed attempt to get the plot started, the only thing left for Isaac to rely on is Ellie as the situation crumbles even faster, because up until that point in the game, it's been a cakewalk compared to what's coming up. The infection is spreading and the advanced necromars are coming out to play. And this is another pitfall of this otherwise brilliant PS3 game, the steep difficulty curve. After around chapter 10 of this game, which was ironically the return to the USG Ishimura chapter, which apparently was docked on Titan Station, the two-thirds mark of Dead Space 2, I was essentially constantly bleeding and living ammo clip to ammo clip up until the credits, because Dead Space 2 only gives you enough that you need to beat the game mostly through the addition that smacking corpses will always net you some cash or ammo, which is a fucking godsend. Jesus Christ be thanked. And there are some sections that get frankly absurd in their bullshit. Namely the heat core reactor thingamajig in chapter 13, where the game sticks you in a small circular room and then spawns in five necromores all at the same time. If you try to bottleneck them at the door, then they'll just reset the combat so you are forced to deal with a constant wave of baddies coming from forward and behind, and trying to juggle between all angles is nearly impossible. Almost every necromorph is an elite, and you'll have to beat your way through around 15 of the bastards. This is the point where my controller was aimed at the television, but I decided to try and run from it at the end, which thankfully worked. Sections like this come around several times at the end, but the fact that they exist at all is a royal buzzkill, like the later chapters of Silent Hill. 
And since I have the power to remember things, let's talk about another thing I liked. See, Dead Space was a very mission-based game with distinct chapters since every time one moved from the other, Isaac would take the tram to get there. But Dead Space 2 has a more Silent Hill-based wandering structure where chapters end and begin at random points in the game, most likely flagged by earned achievements first. It gives a more organic feel of progression and storytelling that works in Dead Space 2's favor because you can't see the punches coming. Like the point when the game ramps up and Strauss decides to amateur dentist Ellie's eye out of her skull full and intact. Although, I suppose it would have been more disgusting if it had been a partial eye botomy, but still, Strauss's condition has worsened to an insane degree beyond his regular insanity, as he keeps talking about a three-step plan that would help Isaac stop the marker, assumedly. Meanwhile, the hallucination Nicole has gotten similarly off the rails as the delusion has morphed into a cacophony voice telling Isaac he's trying to ignore the voice's existence and that he has to make the voice whole. It gets real freaking strange at this point since Isaac knows now that the marker's voice is self-replicating, which causes the craziness and desire to become necrotic in others, and there's another marker on Titan Station because of course there is, this is the freaking 2.0 of the Umbrella Corporation. The man in charge is trying to protect it, but at this point you can pretty much expect that his defense is about as strong as a sandcastle against the tide. If the Necromorphs don't get to it first, then Isaac will find a way eventually. I mean, back in Chapter 7, he managed to survive the Tormentor and an explosion to the face, so Teedman's little firing squad doesn't stand a chance. Especially since Isaac is a man who not only faces his constant delusions of oneness and lost love, but he also overcomes it by accepting that she's gone, which shows that Strauss's real three-step plan of revelationary goodness was actually just the five stages of guilt. But apparently the Visceral writers forgot to tell each other that they missed one on the way to the drawing board. We're almost getting to the end first, but we've got a couple stops to make before we get there, and one is the most famous moment of Dead Space 2, the eye drill. Now, I'm a man who believes that you don't know something unless you experience it yourself, and it rings true with the eye drill, because from how countdowns and let's plays have shown it, this section looks really fiddly and tough to accomplish. That's actually not the case. I do get why people think it's unnerving because frankly it is. The delicate task of following Isaac's twitching and the threat of missing is paramount and delicate, plus the brilliant sound composition behind it adds to the layer of tension since you're trying to accomplish this minute one-shot only task with a constant heartbeat monitor behind you. What hurts the tenseness of the scene is the lack of difficulty from it, since the drill doesn't constantly tick down by itself. You actually control when the drill moves, and Isaac's eye does move in a pattern that you can learn, so hitting the sweet spot isn't all that difficult, and I got it in one shot. Just like the other half of this famous scene where you have to hack the door in the room with the Ubermorph chasing you. The Ubermorph is basically the Hunter 2.0, another regenerator knockoff that you have to cut apart to get time to hack the door open. Yes, the hacking is intense, a bit less than the eye drilling, but again it isn't super difficult since between hacking off all of the Ubermorph's limbs and throwing stasis at it gives you plenty of time to get the puzzle done. What I hated about Dead Space 2 was that we actually never got to defeat the Ubermorph, we just have to run away from it, which is a bullshit cop-out that I wish games would stop. Do not give us an ultimate badass enemy and then not throw us a satisfying death scene for it because technically it's not even a boss fight like it's supposed to be without the death scene. But whatever. Fight your way through another horde, pick up the contact beam for the final boss, seriously, do that, do that, seriously, I am serious, contact beam. Go frickin' find it. And then you finally get to the climax of Dead Space 2 
where you get to kill the non-existent and barely there character Teedman after he's been sort of a dickhead to you for the game, and confront Hallucination Nicole to realize that she's been fucking with you ever since Dead Space, helping you just to get you close to the marker and then kill you under its influence. It's a decent twist, a lot better than the obvious one at the end of the original, but the final boss just kicks any fun to pieces because it's a God of War style horde boss fight that expects you to deal with 16 enemies all at once, with Nicole being able to one hit kill you just by contact. And if you don't have the contact beam, if you don't have the contact beam, go back, run through the horde, go back to the store, pick it up, and then run back here. Seriously, it is way easier than the alternative. The game essentially says fuck you at that point, you didn't pick the right weapon, as you waste 20 attempts trying your best, but if you do manage it by making a loony run back to the store, and then you finally get the marker destroyed. And Ellie picks up your dopey ass, bringing you along to Dead Space 3. Dead Space 2 was a brilliant survival horror game that could have worked out the kinks a bit better. The mystery revolving around Isaac actually involves him as a character, and the other characters keep you off balance making you wonder what's going on throughout all of it as the revelations start coming through the radio. The moment to moment objectives are quite boring and wandery, but they also don't ruin the game and it fits more into the style of progression used. The combat's the exact same back to the wall fun times, which is a claustrophobic and terrifying situation, but does get bullshit difficult at points. And overall, the added design and character to Titan Station and the people Isaac meets there gives the game a lot of life and vibrancy that the original lacked, so it is a great improvement. Yet with Dead Space 2 aiming to be more of a self-contained story, I am wondering what they could pull to have Dead Space 3 be interesting. But that's all the fun for the reviewer, not knowing what's around the corner, especially when you try to hide yourself from the height deliberately. Although, you guys know what's next, your brand new scoreboard. And a tried and true victory for gamers. I hope you guys enjoy the flight.